The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Don't all bolt for the exits when I say this. But big changes are coming here at St. John's. Okay. A few people whose incredible generosity to the church is going to make things permanently different for them, for us, and for the wider church. They are the spiritual successors of the widows in today's readings. We focus on the widows' tiny but precious offerings, in part because it is so emotionally moving, but really because that is the part we can see. But the visible offerings of food and money that these widows make are actually tokens or symptoms of a much greater offering because the true offering took place long before the moments recorded in the scripture readings we heard today. These widows offered their whole selves, their whole lives, their whole being to God. And so these readings are only superficially about momentary acts of giving. They're really about hidden but enduring change, intentional, internal changes, which are later revealed by odd moments of unusual behavior. The true sacrifice in these stories are the widows themselves and they are living sacrifices not objects they are people who live in a pattern of intentional ongoing service to God today I want to tell you about two arrivals and two departures that are occasions in and of themselves, but are really the manifestations of much bigger but less visible gifts of souls, completely and permanently to God. Both, unfortunately, are outside of our view here at 8 o'clock, but at 10.30, Wyatt and Iona Browning are going to be baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The rite of Christian baptism takes very little time, but the transformation of the baptized is for life. Their parents and godparents specifically, and the church in general, are committing themselves to Wyatt and Iona's lifelong formation as Christians, supporting them, but also giving them to Christ and his church. We will be commissioning them to follow Jesus, not knowing what forms of servanthood 
he will call them to undertake, or where his call will take them. This is an unconditional gift, as every gift to God must always be, and a beautiful example of stewardship, the gift of two souls to God, the very opposite of a burnt offering, for this will be a sacrifice that gives new and greater life to the ones being offered, as well as giving God's gifts to the world through them. Two other baptized Christians, David and Kim Prentice, have been following a specific call to servanthood for quite some time now. Two calls, really, but both bound to God through Christian sacraments. First, they gave themselves to Christ and to each other in the sacrament of Christian marriage. And then, David discerned and accepted a call to ministry under the sacrament of holy orders. The next step toward fulfilling that call will be David's service as the curate in the parish of All Saints Episcopal Church in Danvers. And so their last Sunday at St. John's will be November 22nd. I hope you all will support, congratulate, and bless them before they go. And while I love to make jokes at the expense of the clergy in general, the truth is that David's and Kim's departure is a sacrifice. It is a loss to our parish, even as it is a gift to the wider church, the gift of two upstanding and devoted church members. Again, this is the result of their unconditional gift to each other and to God. This is a beautiful example of stewardship, giving from the best of what we as a parish have for the sake of the gospel, even as they give all that they have for the sake of the gospel. That doesn't mean the rest of us are off the hook. Even though most of us were baptized long ago, and as far as I know, most of us don't have any major changes in our immediate future, as far as we know, only we do have a major change in our immediate future if we choose to accept it. The Eucharist changes us. Christians have long debated how the bread and wine change, but the real question is how the sacrament changes us. Our Anglican tradition teaches merely that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, but does not attempt to explain how he is or becomes present, and there I go. As Kelly Pygott recently wrote, it's easier for us to talk about what happens to the bread and wine than it is to do the real work that communion demands, which is to follow Jesus by becoming living sacrifices. For this to happen, we must focus our attention on things that make us uncomfortable. And this is really hard to do, especially of late, since it goes against the grain of popular Christian culture, where the priority seems to be that worship should make us happy. As C.S. Lewis wrote, I haven't always been a Christian. I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. True Episcopalian, obviously. He wrote, if you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. Did the widows in today's stories live in faith because they wanted to be happy? Or because they loved God, loved so deeply that their love and God's love transformed the very essence of who they are? That inner transformation is evident not only in their acts of incredible generosity, but also in their complete lack of regard for the consequences 
of living out their faith. They don't care whether serving God will cost them their lives, let alone whether it will make them more or less happy. Just as our visible material offerings are manifestations of the larger offering of our whole selves to God, our ability to offer ourselves to God is itself a consequence of something greater and even less visible. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. He has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. Most of us have formed or received very negative ideas about the topic of eschatology, which Christians usually get from irresponsible interpretations of the book of Revelation. It's a sad and bitter irony that the whole point of apocalyptic writing is to give hope and encouragement to people here and now. The book of Revelation is written in a symbolic code language to protect ancient Christians from the Roman Empire, whose decisive destruction it envisioned. Those images are bizarre and even scary to us, but the message to the first Christians was clear. Injustice will not and cannot endure forever because God will create a better world. This message is just as necessary in our own age in our own country where injustices are only too familiar, where we might be offered wisdom, grace, competence, and integrity, but the world might choose blatant but familiar lies instead. And despite the injustices here at home, People from all over the world are anxious to move here to escape the even greater injustices in their homelands. The passage we heard from Hebrews uses more accessible language to offer the same assurance. In heaven, Jesus offers himself as a living sacrifice for our benefit so that the end of our age here on earth will not be the sum of sin's corruptions, but rather the transformation of ourselves and our world by and into the goodness and wholeness of God, which God has always intended for all of us. When we submit to baptism, when we choose to receive the Eucharist, when we give ourselves to sacramental vocations like marriage or holy orders, we give ourselves to God as living sacrifices. This plays out within ourselves, changing our values, our priorities, our way of thinking about the world, occasionally breaking out into the world in concrete acts that are only too unusual for their generosity and grace, acts that the world might judge as foolish. In this season, we consider our financial support for St. John's for the next year, but that decision derives all its meaning from the decisions we have already made and continue to make about who we are. The true meaning of stewardship is in giving our whole selves, our whole lives over to God, which begins in our baptism and happens all over again every time we submit ourselves to the Eucharist. And so we can understand everything we do as an act of stewardship a manifestation of our chosen identity 
as the people of God. Stewardship of our resources, of all that we have, is a manifestation of the stewardship of all that we are. The decision to entrust our souls to the one who is always sanctifying them, redeeming them, and making them new. Amen.